We're so grateful to the SEMA Ministry Leader Team for bringing us these presentations that have such depth and meaning and connection to the work that we do here at church. And I want to thank Marilyn Rush, who's here tonight with us as well. She has spoken to us before. She is a death doula and so much more. But it is because of her wonderful blog, The Dying Year, and her regular email that I've been able to find out about people like Christabeth Atwood, who spoke to us last month, and tonight Jen Davidson. And we've been we've been poaching your people because they're so good. And that won't be the second time. It won't be the last time. Tonight we welcome all the way from Lincoln, Nebraska, an old friend to our congregation, Jen Davidson. She was here back in the day, and she'll tell you a little bit more about her journey to get here tonight, but I was thrilled to connect with her to ask her to come and to find out she already had this wonderful um, background with First Presbyterian Church and had reason to come and maybe rekindle those <laughs> connections tonight and this, this week uh, to connect with Mary Lynn and some other friends that she has in the area. So she was able to drive all the way from Lincoln to be here. So you know that other than the crowd you have gathered here, there are many out there appreciative of that. She has a long history with music and other things, and I'm excited for you to know her. She'll tell you a little bit more about herself as we go on, and she talks about our topic tonight of Jared Transcendence. But let us begin with a word of prayer. Center and calm us, O oh God. Give us a deep breath to come into the peace of being, the peace of being with you and one another, the peace of learning together, the peace of loving and the living and the knowledge of dying, and to be able to move into a kind of thought and prayer and wisdom about that that comes because we do the work and reflection to which you call us. We thank you for the gift of Stephen ministers who walk with us, and we thank you most of all for your son, Jesus, for in life and in death we belong to you. And in death there is only life eternal by your grace. And so we are grateful and thankful on this night as we enter into the next week of holiness and the next week what we call Holy Week or Holy Moly Week as ministers among us say. <laughs> we give you thanks that this last week of calm before that wonderful storm of services gives us this refreshing pause tonight with Jen. We ask you to bless her words and her time with us tonight. Keep her safe on her journey back home, and may this be a truly rewarding time for her as well as for us. All these things we ask through Christ our Lord. Let the people say. Amen. Please welcome Jen Davis. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. As Mel told you, um, our connection is Marilyn Rose studied with Mary Lynn, and Mel emailed or called me, I can't remember, and said, would you be willing to come uh, by Zoom to Ann Arbor Presbyterian and talk to us about Jero Transcendence? And I took a deep breath and I said, if it works for you, I'll go one better. I'll come to Ann Arbor Presbyterian <laughs> because I have friends here. Uh, I lived in Michigan for 26 years. You read that. I taught Sunday school for, for uh, Anna Marie Austin way, way, way back in the 80s. Yeah, I was her fifth grade Sunday school teacher for a couple of years. Um, I have a friend over in Royal Oak whose husband died. We were very, very close friends, and he died about 14 months ago, and I had not seen her because of COVID. And so between your invitation and getting to see my friend there, one of the friends online tonight is a Methodist pastor in Rockford, Illinois, who's one of my college friends. So we just got all kinds of fun things going on. What I plan to do are these are the chunks of how I want to set this up. And I want you to interrupt, wave your hand, speak out, do whatever, so that this becomes a dialogue. And Mel's in the back with her laptop checking the chat so that if people online have questions, we can, we can involve them as well. I'm going to talk about this big word first and tell you what it means and where it came from. Then I'm going to tell you how I got interested in this, which will let you know a little bit about my background. Then we'll talk about some of the impediments that keep people from reaching this stage of faith. And then we'll talk specifically as Stephen ministers about how either in your life this becomes something important that you want to journey toward, or if you're working with someone, if you're a caregiver for someone um, as a Stephen minister, why this would be relevant. And then of course, because it's Ann Arbor and because I spent most of my life as a teacher, I'll give you some books to read at the end <laughs> if, you, if you're interested in learning more about this. But again, I encourage you to interrupt. The word tra gero transcendence, um, basically means a developmental stage that occurs when an individual who is living into, and this is important, very old age, 
shifts from a, a materialistic and rational view to a more cosmic and transcendent one, normally accompanied by an increase in life satisfaction. So in other words, you've studied Kohlberg's stages of moral development, you've studied Erickson's stages of development, and what we've discovered now, and this is through the work um, of Lars Tornstam, who is a, this thing is very sensitive, I have to be careful, Lars Tornstam, who is a, a scholar from Sweden, but you've studied these stages of development in other areas, and you know that we start with this thing that's until you're about 20 years old, you're figuring out a little bit about who you are, um, you're often dealing with gender identification at that point, you're getting your schooling behind you, and then the second stage that Erickson and others talk about is this big stage between middle 20s, you know the brain's not fully formed now until you're 27 or 8, so once that brain goes and the frontal lobes are ready and you can start figuring things out, it's about career and family and getting ahead in this second stage. Um, and this is very global and, and broad categories. And then there's this stage when you sort of begin finishing that up. Maybe the kids are raised and you've gotten where you're going in your career. And I picked this gentleman here who's looking sort of, uh, maybe he's thinking he's in his 60s and it might be kidding time. He's thinking, how do you sign up for Medicare? And you know, begin thinking about putting a close to that part of your life where you're thinking about the next house or the next job move. The stage that we're talking about tonight is this one. And this is the woman who is sitting in the chair and thinking, and Jera Transcendence got started for nurses who are looking at this woman and say, oh, come, come, let's play bingo. And what the research is saying is, yes, if she's lonely or depressed, let's go play bingo. But she might be thinking about her life, where did she come from, how do the puzzle pieces of her life fit together? And we, the, the, the research from this, which was Lars Tornstrom's work in Sweden, he said, leave her alone. This is not the time to say, let's go play bingo. If someone's thinking deeply, and we'll go into much more discussion about how you recognize this, this stage of Jared Transcendence. But the point he did, and the book, his book is fascinating, and I have got it here, and we'll believe it if you want to take a look at it. This is pages and pages and pages of, um, thank you, um, not only uh, quantitative research with interviews, but lots of qualitative data-driven graphs and charts. So this is really serious work that Lars Tornstam did in Sweden, documenting that this stage exists, what it's like, how people feel, what their needs are when this stage occurs. Now let me tell you how I got interested in this. When I left Michigan, I had lived here 26 years and I was working at the Oakland ISD and it was time to retire and I had, it was during 2008 and you remember the auto industry was in the toilet and they, we were told at the Oakland ISD on opening day in 2009, there's 300 of us sitting in the room and our superintendent said this time next September there will be 22,000, there will be 200 of you. So in 2008, there were 300 of us at the Oakland, like I used to do a lot of work at the Washtenaw ISD too, so you know, wonderful collaboration. Um, next year, there will be 200 of you sitting here. We've got to find 100 people to retire. So long story short, I had lived in nine states at that point, a real pilgrim, and I wanted to live a place I'd never lived. So I moved to Lincoln, Nebraska. Some of you know Tom Trenny, the musician. He and I are real good buddies, and he had moved out to Lincoln, and I kind of followed him, sang in his choir. And after about a year and a half, I had rested, and then I went back to school, and I did a three-year lay pastor program, and then I did some spiritual direction program, and it was just kind of fun for me at that point. I didn't have any long-term goals of, you know, being pastor of a big church like this. I was just trying to put it all together and learn some things. So at the end of the spiritual direction two years, you have to do a final project. And I'm thinking, oh, geez, what am I going to do for a final? I'd gone down to Asheville, North Carolina, to four times a year to Canuga, a conference center down there. And at the end of this now, I've got to do this project, and I'm thinking, what in the heck am I going to do? Well, at that point, I was 69. I'm 77 now. That'll save you some mental math. I was 69 years old, and a friend said to me, Jen, you're thinking all this time about aging, and you're always talking about 69, and you're about to be 70, and you're 69, and you're going to be 70. You've read the research on those decade birthdays, whether it's 30 or 40 or 50. Those are big ones, and we think hard kind of when that, when that flip that decade happens. So my friend in Lincoln, she was a pastor. She said to me, Jen, why don't you do your final project on spirituality and aging? And I thought, oh, okay. So being a true soul of Ann Arbor, I went out and bought 15 books on spirituality and aging and read everything I could get my hands on and got my final project going. I was at Gladstone's Library in Wales, 
which is a place I love to go study. It's one of the two residential libraries in the world. You have a room there, they have wonderful food service, and you take classes. And I'm at Gladstone's Library in Wales, and we're coming out of our class, and we're having a meal, and the woman's sitting next to me. You know how you do when you're meeting a new person? She says, so who are you, and what do you do? So I told her, what's well, blah, 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 blah. She was a professor of occupational therapy at Cornwall University in England. Let me say it again. She was a professor of occupational therapy at Cornwall University in England. And when I said, well, the thing I'm really digging into right now, because I'm trying to finish a project, is I'm studying spirituality and aging. And she said to me, well, you do know about gerotranscendence. <laughs> And I said, no, what in the heck is gerotranscendence? In which case, she began to introduce the nurses and Sweden and the subject and the topic. And the rest of this has been truly been history for me. I went on and was ordained in the UCC and doing all kinds of interesting things and becoming an end of life doula with my wonderful, I've never met her in the flesh till an hour ago. Oh. <laughs> We've always done everything online. We had dinner, it's like, oh, she exists, she's not on the screen. Um, so the Jarrah Transcendence comes across everything I do. Uh, I've removed to a retirement community. I'm one of the youngest ones there. There are about 100 people that live there, most of them in their 80s and 90s. And somebody said, you got your lab right there, right? So you can study <laughs> transcendence all around you. Absolutely. But for me personally, I've got one foot in being here with you tonight, 77, driving around kind of, you know, at the end of that guy with the white hair scratching his head, what am I going to do when I get old? But I've also got very much one foot in living into this fourth stage of spiritual uh, mysticism, cosmic partnership, all the things that begin to happen as you start to think about this uh, stage of your life, and we'll talk more about that. But that's how I got to studying gerotranscendence and Mel's invitation and how I got here tonight from Lincoln, Nebraska. I'm on the road visiting friends and headed for West Virginia tomorrow morning. I'm a, you hear it in my voice? I'm a West Virginia, yeah, <laughs> West Virginia mountain girl. Never, never goes away. Alrighty, so let's take a look now what this is all about. Oh, I have to get where the computer picks this little clicker up, I think. Well, maybe not. There we go. I have to tell you about this. You may wonder how I live in Nebraska and keep my Michigan roots. When I moved there, they were in the Big 12. Within six months, they had joined the Big 10, and life got very complicated. <laughs> so in Nebraska, everybody puts these wooden things on their doors. That's mine. That's mine. And for the people in Nebraska, it is not New Mexico. <laughs> But that's how I live in booting Go Big Red for my Huskers, and every time it's also Big Go Blue. And, the, and when I have a t-shirt I hang on my door that says Michigan on it, lots of good things. So that's how I keep my loyalty to you guys as well as my loyalty to Nebraska. So here are the characteristics. If a person is moving into this stage of gerotranscendence, they will become less self-occupied. It's a lot less about them and more about what's going on in the greater world more altruistic. It's so fun to meet with my older friends, and they talk a lot about giving their money away, going through their clothes. Now we have so many refugees from Ukraine. They're working very hard to think, what can I do to make the world a better place? This is one of my favorites. Avoid social interactions, unnecessary. I was with a woman last night who said, you know, I just don't go to dinner anymore with people I don't want to go to dinner with. <laughs> and don't you remember when you were in your 40s and 50s and you had to go with the boss's family or you had to go with your kids' in-laws or whatever? Yeah, it was important in those years because you were networking and so on. I watch now, and if you don't want to go to the ball game, don't go to the ball game. If you don't want to go to the movies and four of your friends are going, and these, if you're at that stage in your life, a lot of times you just say, Go and have a great time. I'm not into the movies tonight. By the way, I will give anybody you want this presentation so you don't have to take a lot of notes. Yeah, I'll just send, email the whole thing to you. Um, decreased interest in material things is huge. It's not about what car you drive anymore. It's not about having the latest fashion and clothes. So you watch, the, as a Stephen minister, some of the folks that you're working, and some of us who are sitting in this room, after, last time I did this presentation, somebody said to me, there's a name for what I'm feeling. Yeah, there's a name for what, these things that are starting to happen in my life. I'm an off-the-charts extrovert. I get energy from people, but I find I really treasure my alone time now. Really treasure my alone time. We'll talk more about this roles business in a few minutes. 
middle people identify as I'm an educator, I'm a lawyer, uh, that they, I, a big part of their identity is I'm the mother of four children. We'll talk more about this because this is one of the impediments when people can't let go of that. I love to listen to older people talk about uh, this sense of excitement about they don't quite get it, but they know it all. I had lunch today or breakfast this morning with a man over in um, Clarkston that I used to work and teach with, and he's never been churched much at all, but he has God in his life in ways now that I would never imagine because he keeps talking about the mystery and how it all fits together. And he says, I'm not sure there's a God, but there's something, in, there's some kind of energy, there's something out there bigger than we are, and that's what this is about. It's what he was trying to explain to me at breakfast this morning. This one's huge. Is you spend a lot of time when you cross over into true Jero transcendence, thinking about all the forks in the road in your life, things that may have seemed like an, a tragedy or a mistake or this gift that came out of nowhere. And you start saying, oh, I see now. I had breast cancer three years ago. And in the cancer community, we talk about twisted gifts. I would never have asked for breast cancer, but man, I'm glad I had it because I have an understanding and an empathy and a, and a way of living my life, not just for cancer, but for ALS or, or a, a congestive heart failure, any of those things that I don't know that I would have had. And that's a piece of my jigsaw puzzle is my time with breast cancer. Ancestry.com. I say wherever the people I work with are on the continuum, and I have a one woman who lives where I do who is a self-proclaimed atheist, and she is one of the kindest, nicest people you'd ever want to meet, so I say she's a Jesus gal, she just doesn't call it that, all the way over to another woman who goes to Mass every single morning, and when these people get near the end of their life and they know they're coming to die, they all want to talk about this kind of not afraid, but knowing there's something greater, this sense of moving on. So this, these are characteristics that you can look for either in yourself or as a Stephen minister when you're visiting with someone. And these are the characteristics and the kinds of things that you begin noticing that they're talking about. Quick summary of those. Some are the cosmic dimension. This is summarizing what was on the previous slide. Sort of this helicopter view of the whole idea of spirituality, thinking of themselves, confronting their story, their jigsaw puzzles, and then thinking about the relationships with things, materialism, and people. And one of the big things with that is what we call spiritual distress. And if you're going to work as a Stephen minister with someone who's dealing with Joe transcendence, there may be regrets of forgiveness that they're looking for, broken relationships. I worked with one woman who'd been divorced from her first husband 30 years. She knew she was dying. He had remarried. All she wanted to do was see this man and just talk about the good things and the two children they had had together. And thank God, between their kids and me and a couple other people, not only did he come, but he brought flowers. And they sat and they talked an hour about that time in their life when they had been young and been in love and were married and had these two children that they'd raised together. So that's what I mean by the relationship thing, that that was before she died, that was really important to her, that she be able to celebrate that and not leave with a bad taste in her mouth that the marriage had not worked for over the long haul. Here are the things that pe keep people from getting across. I like to think of it as a threshold like a doorway, you know, you're standing here and here's your life and your career and your family and this kind of a doorway. And then there's this liminal space. I love the idea of liminal space. You can't go back and you're not sure what's forward. It's the day you graduated from college. It's the day you brought the baby home, the first baby home from the hospital. You can't go back to not, you can't go back to college and you can't go back to not being a parent, but you truly don't know what it's going to feel like as you move through that liminal space into the future. These are the impediments with your transcendence that keep people from passing into that um, in a positive way. The social ones are the media. The media is incredibly, incredibly ageist. And I invite you to start watching commercials closely. It's not only the ones about every pill for everything possible, which makes people think, you know, as soon as I'm 65, I'm going to start having all these things wrong with me. The one that's making me most crazy right now is 
combining your home and auto on progressive life insurance so we don't grow up to be like our parents. <laughs> yeah, you've seen that one. And I want to say, when you are entering this age of life where at 77 years old, I'm sorry, I don't want middle class values. I don't want a bigger house. I don't want to go to the ball game, and I do care where I park, if you've seen that commercial. <laughs> yeah, I do care where I park, because although I'm still wearing my Apple Watch and trying to get my steps in, it's not that I can climb to the top bleachers like I used to at Tiger Stadium and, and Comerica Park for 20 years watching the Tigers. So those, I don't want those values, and the commercials make us think there's something wrong with us yeah, if we don't have that. So the media just, you know, it goes on and on. You've seen all the, the pictures and the airbrushed pictures and so on. Separation of families is big. Um, in our great-grandparents era, when grandma and grandpa were in the farmhouse and grandma or grandpa died, then one of the kids in their family usually moved back into the farmhouse, took care of the aging great-grandparent, and death and aging was seen as a normal part of life because there sat grandma and grandpa at the dinner table every night. And when they got old, that was the wisdom and the stories, and they were part of the family. Now that we're spread all over everywhere, people live where I live, which is in a retirement community, because I have one daughter, and she lives in Louisville, Kentucky. <laughs> so, you know, far away from Nebraska. So the idea of having people around you who are successfully and meaningfully aging uh, is a thing that's holding us back from this, this whole going successfully into this gyro transcendence. The funeral industry, I love to talk about. Um, this one is fun and it's controversial, but uh, two of my really good friends are funeral directors in, in Nebraska. If you take a body of a person who's died and they've been very, very sick, and the body is there, that's what it looks like. And in the olden days, Thank you, teacher Mary Lynn. She's taught me a lot about home funerals and green burials and so on. The body was cleaned. It was wrapped in a quilt. It was beautifully and dutifully buried on the property. Well, now the goal is to make that person look like they looked 20 years ago. And so this, again, is just a little tiny piece of, of us not feeling like this body is getting older and being proud of the wrinkles and proud of the scars rather than, than uh, trying to make the body look younger. These are the personal ones. Job preoccupation. Across the hall from me, where I live in my retirement community, there is a man and his wife who are both 92. He is a federal judge who has an office in Kansas, offices in Kansas City, St. Louis, Des Moines, and Minneapolis and Omaha. Federal judge. So he's got an office in that, all those places in his district. He's 92, and he only retired officially from that when he was 90. Now they've moved down to assisted living, nice big apartment down there. He's got the dining room table set up with his law books and his laptop, and after morning he gets up and he has his breakfast and his coffee, and he takes his coffee, and every single morning, five days a week, he listens to the Supreme Court out of D.C. This man will be a judge and a lawyer until he draws his last breath. And my hope of him coming into the threshold and into liminal space where he wants to think about the jigsaw puzzles of his life and meaning and, and, and spiritual. I mean, they go to church every Sunday, but I don't hold out a lot of hope for him crossing into some sort of pensive, beautiful moment of thinking about cosmic partnership with the universe because he's concerned about the newest case in front of the Supreme Court. One of the risky ones is this, is people who identify as a grandparent. Let me say that again. Their job preoccupation is, I'm a grandparent. And so they're almost trying to live their life again. And all they talk about, all, and there's nothing wrong with being a grandparent. My 40-year-old daughter is going to have a baby this summer. It's quite a surprise for all of us. Um, so the grandparenting is wonderful, but I don't see myself as only and strictly as a grandmother. I see myself as many facets to my life. And I have friends who live where I do that they, don't, they can't talk about much else except what their grandparents and now many of them great-grandparents, great-grandchildren are doing. So that becomes their job. And it's finding toys and reading books and where they're going to go to college. And if they're, you know, if they're going off to look at colleges, they know everyone they went to and all that they looked at. They're, they've just assumed that new role now is, is uh, overwhelming grandparenting. Um, let's see what we do here to get rid of that one. The body ailments and appearance. I don't know what I did to do that, but we'll just leave that. And we'll know it's not going to do something until I tell it to. I don't want to do that. Wait a minute. Could you just go outside of that box and put it somewhere in a black shirt or go on the slide itself? 
Good idea. That's good. Ah, life is good. Whoever, was that you, Mel? Whoever said that? Thank you. Oh, Mary, Kay, Mary Lynn, thank you. Um, let me start out by saying I don't have anything against people dyeing their hair because when my mother's hair started graying, it got yellow and wiry and it was really ugly and my mother overnight became a blonde and it was one of the best things she ever did because her gray hair was really yucky. But she did it because her hair was just about unmanageable. I have a woman in a church choir who's 91, a retired university professor whose hair is coal black and it has nothing to do with the quality of her hair. There's women who live where I do who dress like they're trying to have the, you know, they go to Nordstrom's or Von Mar or one of these places and buy clothes off the rack that the 40 year olds are buying. Um, so this is this, this body appearance of being pr not being proud of your wrinkles, not being proud of these, these skin tags we get. My dermatologist calls them birthday barnacles. And we are going to get, yes, we are going to get birthday barnacles. And so, yeah, we say, you know, this is aging. This is my body. This is body has carried me through all kinds of experiences and birthing a child and, and, and travel and learning and craziness. But it's, the, my, it's my body and I'm not trying to make it look different. So that's what that means about changing the body or the personal appearance. Um, and then ego focus is that if someone is standing at the threshold, in order to let go and move into zero transcendence, you have to have a sense of you're part of something bigger than you are and it can't be all about you. And so if someone is totally focused on their aches, their pains, their story, their life, and they can't uh, even just sit and look at a sunset and see that it's more beautiful. By the way, the big evergreens in the lakes, I'm mighty glad to see. That's what I miss most about, Link, about uh, being in, in uh, Michigan. Um, if you can't look at all the lakes here and see the, it snowed like crazy coming through Commerce Township today. Big wet snow and I just pulled over and let it snow. <laughs> it was beautiful. But that's a sense of something bigger than, than we are and people who, some people are not able to get there. Now here's what I'd like for you to do. In sets of two, three, um, let's see. If you will talk to the two behind you, will that work? Oh, yeah. And kind of make a two, Irene, how about come up here and introduce yourself to this lady? She needs a partner. And, or over here, that'll work, that'll work. Yeah, anyway, get with somebody. Uh, you can work this out. But here's your task, here's your task. Where have you seen this happen in your life? One of those impediments, either in your life personally or someone you've worked with as a Stephen minister, maybe an, a member of your family, but bring this home now. Where have you seen people unable to deal with the, the healthy aging process in a concrete example and just share one another back and forth for about a minute? Okay, let's see. Oh, good. Th thank you, guys. Thank you.
Are you picking up anything I need to know about? Uh, no one's got questions, but we've got about 12 people watching online right now. Okay. If you'll please bring your conversation to a stopping point, and please bring your conversation to a close. You may stay where you are or turn back, whatever makes you comfortable. Rather than sharing out, let me put this question. What questions do you have? Do you have anything that's bubbled up that you want to talk more about or that didn't seem clear or that you want to expound on? Rather than just sharing examples, please. Kelly? Is, is it um, Kathy. a rarity for people to accomplish or get into Jiro Transcendence? I think that would be culturally dependent. In America, probably less so than some other places. The Native American tribes, this was a given. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so culturally, and then Irene and I were talking in the hall earlier, uh, I think some people start this um, almost in childhood. I, one of my books I'm going to show you tonight is a book for children, and some children just have this sense, and they carry it with them almost their whole life, but then they get busy raising family, getting a job, but then it's so deeply embedded in them that it blossoms kind of naturally. Yeah. Someone else? Please. It's a, it would be a piece of what it means to be an old soul. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I was just thinking of, you know, what dementia does um, to, you know, to be able to not, doesn't let you be here. Um, Interestingly enough, some of my friends with dementia are here. Uh, well and that's where they live. Yeah. Well, and again, it's like the general population. It's, it's like the general population. Some get there yeah. and some don't. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. that's very interesting. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But it's the same kind of, yeah, yeah. there's no uh, yeah. black or white, yes or no. Yeah. yeah. Jen? Please. Can you repeat the comments and questions that you may be able to? I certainly will. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Please. My younger brother was paranoid schizophrenic and spent most of his life blessedly in a VA home rather than on the street where I didn't know where he was. The question was, what does mental illness have to do with this? Um, he would say things to me like, my voices tell me it's good to believe in God. And so again, I think it's personal, personality dependent. I have a number of friends with pretty severe bipolar and we talk some about this, and they, they wonder, can they carry this sense with them when they're up, and can they carry this sense with them when they're, when they're in the darkest of the depression? Mm -hmm. So this, in my world, is conversations that, and that's where we're going to go next, is how do, you, how do you relate to someone who is either not able to be there, wants to be there, is, is moving in that direction? Yeah. That and stuck was your word. Yeah, the person is stuck in this victimhood. Yeah. Let's, if you will, let's hold that for just a minute. Let me move on now with how we can help people who either want to or you sense that there's an opening that they might move to this. And let's swing back to that and see if they fit together maybe. Okay? All righty. Um, so as Stephen Ministers clergy caregivers, how do we support this developmental stage? And let's say in general, but also possibly in dementia and also possibly in folks with mental illness. And we'll just kind of play with this and see. Um, I believe that faith formation and spiritual growth happens in three areas of our lives. Now, we're going to take a step here and kind of talk big theologically and faith formation for a minute. 
Leave your transcendence to the side. We're coming right back to it. But this is for all of us, regardless of age or wherever we are. This is how we develop spiritual muscle, or this is how our faith formation grows throughout the course of our life. I believe often it starts with doing for God. And I think about when I was a little girl, we got a dollar allowance, and there was never a question, but a dime of that went in Sunday school every Sunday. I think I see it now with people who serve at the food pantry, people who are always helping with Habitat for Humanity. I think this is one of the places where people feel this connectedness, is that they're doing something altruistic, they're giving back, they're being helpful. The question is, is that the only place where they're growing? Because there's three possible areas, and that's one of them. Another one is knowing about God. This is the person who comes faithfully to Bible study, maybe takes some classes uh, in, in uh, church history, maybe a person who very carefully notes the sermon and comes to the sermon, talk back every Sunday and talks to the pastor, knowing about God. Um, one of my favorite things in that circle is I loved, I just finished a, several courses on the Quran with one of my Sufi teachers at Duke University. I like to know about, I go to Torah study every Saturday morning. I want to know what my other faith traditions are learning and what they have to say about God. But that's not doing for God. That's cognitive. That's me teach learning or someone else learning about God. It's not doing for God. But here's the one that's intriguing. Knowing God. There's where we move toward our transcendence. Is the idea that this is light of God, the goodness of God is in me, it's in all of creation. And how do I start having that um, sense and not only but that practice. One of the practices I have is comes from the Ignatian tradition. There's a little card on my nightstand that says examine. Do you know examine? Yeah, where have I, where have I felt God in my life today? That's an idea of thinking about knowing God. So, you know, just like the lunch, the brunch I had with this man I haven't talked to for 10 years this morning, and listening to him talk about, I've never really been very churched, but I've come to the point where I believe there was God at that brunch table today. There was spiritual, beautiful energy passing between the two of us as we're sitting having this conversation. So part of Jared Transcendence is at least the person, or you as the Stephen minister relating to this person, knowing that this circle exists. Um, so where do we know about God? The scripture tells us, first of all, that it's when Jesus left, he says, you know, I can't be here forever, so I'm leaving behind this sense of spirit. This, and there's several, I just picked one, there's several passages, you know, where we're told in the scriptures that there will be this sense of spirit. Did you know that was the lectionary Sunday? No. <laughs> Do, 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 do. No, I walked in, I thought, gosh, I wish I'd worn my purple sweater. <laughs> now, was that the lectionary Sunday? Well, 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 uh, examine tonight. Where did I feel close to God today <laughs> when I realized that I was using, of all the ones I could have picked, the one that was the lectionary? Um, where might God be experienced? Um, this I mentioned when I was in uh, North Carolina studying spiritual direction. One of my teachers was Pittman McGehee. Wonderful, wonderful Episcopal priest uh, turned Jungian analyst, and these are his ideas. People can experience God in nature. That's one that comes across pretty readily mm -hmm. with me sitting watching it snow today and feeling this connectedness to the universe. If you ever want to come see me in Nebraska, man, we got sunsets that'll just knock your socks off. And we get, because it's so flat and so wide and so beautiful. Oh my golly, they're just stunning. And it's almost every night. It's hard to look at those and not think there's something bigger and greater than, than we are. If you said it, by the way, have you been reading all the research about trees? Oh my gosh, the mother tree, now you know that where they put the radioactivity into it and then it begins to spread to the roots of the other trees. This whole thing of the hidden life of trees, yeah, I mean, just, I get chills just talking about it. This is where this spiritual connectedness comes. Pittman tells me that we can experience God in the arts and creativity. That's a lot of what took me to Lincoln, Nebraska. I just loved singing with Tom Trenny in those days. And, you know, singing whether it's the Elijah or some African chant or whatever, there's this sense of connectedness with the people that are singing with me and the generations of people who have sung before me. Um, I just spent four days with a woman who's very much into the visual arts. And we talked a lot about how she, the things that she sees with color and light and so on. She feels this connectedness to spiritual energy. We can have God in rituals. Uh, some people will tell me their best moment of the week is when the congregation says the Lord's Prayer together. Or uh, the Lord be with you and also with you. They answer back. Those are the moments they feel connected to the community and connected to spiritual energy. Relationships, hard to hold a new baby. 
Hard to hold the hand of someone who's dear to you and not sense there's some sort of connectedness. Um, that there's, there's something bigger than we are, that, 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 that positive energy. This is one I'm working on. Um, for a lot of reasons I could spend a lot of time talking, I kind of tend to live in my head. And one of the things I'm really working on is trusting my intuition. Maybe that's why that scripture turned up. <laughs> but feeling this sense of something is the right moment to do, or it's the right thing to say, or I really need to call that person and do it. So there's something bodily that a feeling, that an intuition, a sense that comes. Um, two of my best friends in Lincoln are deep into biospiritual focusing. That's the name of what they're studying. And this is helping people have a sense of the, the bigger message of uh, God acting, spirit acting in our bodies. Dreams, well, I just told you my whole spiritual direction was very Jungian based. Um, you know, we believe so much that dreams were a huge part of our scripture. You know, Old Testament, Joseph and the dream coat, and all of what happened with dreams and, you know, even uh, the Old Testament prophets and so on. Joseph in the New Testament dreamed he should get the family to Egypt, dreamed he should go ahead and marry this woman who was already pregnant. So we trust dreams in our scriptural tradition, and yet as, as adults in 2022, we say, oh, it was just a nightmare. Oh, it was just a dream. Well, what the, the experts would say to you is in this individual unconscious and the collective unconscious, we really need to find that the message in the, in, that God can be speaking to us in our dreams if we will just pay attention and work either with a group or someone who's trained, not some goofy person that says if it's blue it must mean this. Um, but the, the whole idea of spiritual energy coming through dreams is just one that we tend to overlook. And then last but not least, suffering. And I alluded to that earlier with the cancer ministry. Um, I think that there's a real sense of a deepening fellowship, deepening relationship, not only with God, but with other people who have been part of this group. So my question to you, let's start with you. Most everyone has a default. So which of those seven is where you would say you feel your best, deepest, most meaningful, consistent connection with God, spiritual energy, higher power, whatever you want to call it? What do you think? Relationships. Relationships. What else? Nature. 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 Can I add a the arts. <laughs> Please. Well, meditating on scripture. He would call that ritual. Uh, I wouldn't, but that's okay. Mm -hmm. And meditating on my own life. Yeah, that's really fascinating. Now, I'm quick to think as I meditate on my life, am I meditating on my cancer or my daughter's going to have a baby or my alcoholic father and what I learned and there was where I found a lot of God growing through that. I tend to put it in one of those categories, but you've got me saying there's probably more and it could be very individual. It could be very individual, but just the idea that we have a default that whether it's nature, relationships, whatever. But here's my question to you then. Which one are you least likely to go to? And might you challenge yourself to try to find God there? Yeah. Yeah. Which one are you least likely to go to? Mm -hmm. Ritual. It becomes rote to you rather than, yeah, is that? And I know mine is body. As I said earlier, I tend to live in my head. Yeah. So now let's click into Stephen Ministry. The big key in this is where you go and the person you're caregiving go may not be the same. And so now you kick into all this listening is an act of love that you know how to do. So that when they begin talking to you, it's not a matter of saying, oh, wait, let me tell you, if you just listen to Mozart, you know, things would be... No, it's if, if you could know that theirs may very much be... And it might be in their suffering, and that's where I'm curious about the person who is the victim. It might be that, that if somehow they could find God in that suffering, and they could examine, you know, can, is there a time you felt God was with you during all of that? And then maybe the possibility of branching out to one of these others with that person so that they have a sense of brightness and hope. I don't know because I don't know that person. But I know we all have a default, and we all have one that is just waiting to be tapped. <laughs> 
And some of it's probably, you know, temperament, introvert, extrovert, Myers-Briggs, personality styles, all those kinds of things. I just think it's fascinating as a caregiver, as a pastor, as clergy, to think about different people come to God in different ways. And then we kick into the deep listening that we've all been, been encouraged to do. I talked earlier about thresholds. This is the Bay of New Beginnings on the island of Iona. All good Presbyterians have heard of Iona, I think. <laughs> Four times I've been there. <laughs> this is the Bay of New Beginnings. Um, yeah, I love Iona. That's one of my places to, happy places and to study. Um, but this is the idea that if you're going to successfully move into Jared Transcendence or journey with someone who is. I mean, you may not be ready. You're a Stephen minister. You still, maybe you're working or have a job or kids to raise. But if you sense someone is going there and you want to journey with them spiritually and emotionally, it's a new beginning for them. It's letting go of materialism. It's letting go of ego. It's letting go of job, feeling like their, their job is their identity. Um, so being aware that that threshold is there and being, being able and willing to, to cross that threshold with them so, if you want to learn some more about this, here's Can I some. Ask you a question? Absolutely. Isn't our entire culture completely against going into this phase? I don't think our entire culture is against it, but I would say that there's a big, massive push tsunami coming at us with the media, and with all the things. But I sense, a, I sense a lot of young people, because of climate change, and because of just waking up to what's going on in Ukraine. I sense a lot of p young people are particularly feeling this cosmic partnership, uh, if nothing else, because of climate change, that we are all, and then, well, one of the books, let me change, let me go to one of the books, and I think that'll, that'll talk about this too. I've shown you Jero Transcendence, it's up here if you want to look at it. If you're a fan of Richard Rohr, Falling Upward is the one that talks about going from this uh, busy work-a-day kind of life into what he calls the, the falling upward into a, a deeper spiritual awareness. Um, now, Mary, uh, Mary Lynn, here's the answer to that question. Quantum theology, some of the quantum physicists are telling us now that um, there, it's the Bose particle, that there are things that they cannot prove are related to one another, but they are acting on, on each other. Um, a friend just died and she told me her husband moved from particle to wave. <laughs> and I just loved it because that may be what it is. He's, he's moved from particle to wave. Um, Robert Larga, who's, I think I have his name right, who's one of the premier quantum physicists in the world, says we know there's parallel universes and he's beginning to get the math on the board that says that may be where the spirits gather. Now the Hindu would say we come back as something else but he's saying that this energy's got to go somewhere because energy doesn't die. And if there is energy in us, so that's the book I would say if you're interested in the science part of this. This is my children's book that I just found that I love so much called Finding God in All I See, Finding God in You and Me. And it's exactly what we've been talking about, but for children. You know, it's the idea that there's God in everything. Um, my newest one, which I don't think I've even had time to put on there yet, is The Inner Work of Age. The spookiest thing happened. I was with a young woman yesterday, young, she's 60, uh, and she's good friends with a psychiatrist, a pretty well-known psychiatrist in Bloomfield Hills, and she said, this woman's got me reading The Inner Work of Age. Do you know that book? And I went, that's the book I'm carrying all over the United States while I travel in underlining and writing in the margins. This is Jero Transcendence in action. In other words, Lars Tornstrom has the research and names the concept. This is a retired uh, therapist, PhD, who's written a number of books, and this is Jero Transcendence in action. She talks about things like middle class values on aging people in the media and all the things that we've been talking about. Or you can reach me. If you want to talk more about this, and there's, I'll give you, uh, I've got a card if you want to call or want to talk, because I love to talk about this stuff. And I want to close with some thoughts from Thich Nhat Hanh. Thich Nhat Hanh says, and this is a piece of his writing, I am not here. Oh, sorry. 
I am not in here. This is written by, Thich, you know Thich Nhat Hanh, right, Vietnamese? I have a disciple in Vietnam who wants to build a stupa for my ashes when I die. He and others want to put a plaque with the words, here lies my beloved teacher. I told them, do not waste the temple land. Do not put me in a small pot and put me in there, I said. I don't want to continue like that. It would be better to scatter the ashes outside to help the trees grow. I suggested that if they are still interested in building a stupa, then they have to have another plaque that says, I am not in here, but in case people don't get it, they should add another plaque that says, I'm not out there either. <laughs> if people still don't understand, then you can write on another plaque that said, I may be found in your way of walking and breathing. This body of mine will disintegrate, but my actions will continue me. In my daily life, I always practice to see my continuation all around me. We don't need to wait until the total disillusion of this body to continue. We continue in every moment. If you think that I am only this body, then you have not truly seen me. When you look at my friends, you see my continuation. When you see someone walking with compassion, you know that he is my continuation. I don't see why we have to say I will not die because I can already see myself in you, in other people, and in future generations. Even when, there is a, even when the cloud is not there, it continues as snow or rain. It is impossible for a cloud to die. It can become rain or ice, but it cannot become nothing. The cloud does not need to have a soul in order to continue. There's no beginning and there's no end. I will never die. There will be a dissolution of this body, but that does not mean my death. I will continue always. That's stereo transcendence. And when you begin to believe that, then you're on the way. What questions do you have? Then I always close the pastor part of me and say, friends, life is short and there's precious little time to gladden the hearts of those who travel with us. So be quick to be kind, make haste to love, and let us go in peace. Amen. Amen. Thank you. <laughs>